Welcome to Goldfish on Games. And seeing it's that point of year again, you know the one where it's either the most romantic time of the year or just a made up event to sell cards and chocolates. I figured let's talk about a game that has heart. I mean, a lot of heart. Lots and lots of heart. And that game is obviously Harlequin for the Amiga. Made by the Warp Factory and published by Gremlin in 1992, it might be the strangest game ever made. And if you don't believe me, look, it's written right there on the box. And if you can't trust what's written on a box, who can you trust? The game came on two double-sided double-density floppy disks, which must have been a real feat of compression, as they stuffed a large amount of graphics and music in that 1.7 megabytes of space. Also in the box was a manual, and in some releases it actually even had an offer that allowed you to buy a pin based on this game as well as a few others. I never got to see this pin in person, but thanks to the Gremlin Archive, it's actually possible to take a look at it. And boy, it's terrifying. It looks like a highwayman ready to eat your soul. One of the reasons the game managed to fit on two discs was the fact there was no intro sequence. Instead, the story is provided in the book. And it tells of the tale of a kid who created an imaginary world to play in, the world of Chimera, and was fueled by the innocent wonder that only a child could provide. And over the years, he explored this world and had many adventures, but as he grew older, he visited less and less. And as his thoughts turned to those of a mundane adult full of the stresses and strains of real life, Chimera turned cold, and the creatures that inhabited it grew twisted and evil, till eventually the heart of Chimera broke. But many years later, a figure appeared over the dunes of the Dream Mile. The kid had returned, and he vowed to fix the heart and return Chimera to the joyful place it once was. From what looks like a colourful and light-hearted game from the screenshots, boy does it have a bit of a dark story. Starting the game, you are introduced to an epic bit of music, which has been playing through this video, and a funky title screen, and already we can see the heart motif starting to take hold, with them bouncing around all over the screen as well as being used as a full screen fade to change between different scenes. And with no real options to choose from, we are very quickly into the game, and we are introduced to the map screen. It doesn't allow you to select a level, but it does show you where you currently are, and your progress towards collecting the four pieces of the Broken Heart, which will require you to travel deep into Chimera. You start at the Clock Tower, which you will return to a number of times. Yes, this isn't your typical platformer, it's more of an adventure platformer hybrid, similar to games like Metroid, but it's less about upgrades and more about working out the environmental puzzles, which will allow you to travel further in the game. The game, while not exactly easy, does want you to do quite well, as any time you see a light bulb over your head, if you stand still for a couple of seconds, the game will give you a bit of a hint on what you need to do. You won't be standing still for very long, as you'll very quickly want to move the character around and start firing your main weapon, the Love Heart, which on this first level you'll be using to take out Grandfather Clocks and Alarm Clocks. The enemies you encounter are all themed around the current level, and range from weird to outright bizarre, and possibly even a little bit scary. And while the game doesn't have an upgrade system, there are a number of power-ups and items that you can pick up on your travels, such as the brolly, which you'll use to slow yourself down while you're falling, so you won't hurt yourself, or the rocket, which acts as an orbiting weapon which will damage anything it touches. One of the more useful items is the space hopper. This will not only allow you to travel faster, but you're also effectively invulnerable while you're on it. But all of these items are limited use, and will deplete the more you use them. But fret not, as you'll find replacements in the present boxes dotted around the levels, which can contain either items or a burger which will replenish your health. But just remember, because of the backtracking, it might not be wise to pick them up the first time you see them. And if you do trigger the box, you can actually just leave it for a few seconds, and it will actually rewrap itself, and it will be ready to pick up some other time. And after a few switches, we'll find that we've opened up the door at the beginning of this level, and we can really start to get an idea of the size of this game, as the clockworks has a number of exits in it, and you'll need to open them up to continue further. You'll very quickly find that some switches that you initially thought did absolutely nothing are actually opening up areas in completely other levels in the game. So get ready to have to travel around the world working out what you've triggered with each switch. Though thankfully, this map screen does give you an indication that you are actually progressing, as your completion percentage does increase. Now this might seem like an absolutely massive task, but thankfully the game actually supports saving your progress. 
Interestingly, I don't think this is mentioned anywhere in the game, only in the manual, but if you're on the map screen you can use the F1 and F2 keys to either save or reload your game. This is very handy as the levels continue to get more and more complex the further you go, with not only really aggressive baddies but also environmental hazards, like the wind that keeps pushing you back on the Dream Mile, or pools of water that will require the Angelfish item to progress further. One black mark I have against the game is the fact they did the common thing of the time and either had music or sound effects, not both at the same time. Thankfully the music is bloody good from beginning to end, and while it might have been compromised if they had to inject sound effects or use a dedicated sound channel for them, I still think it would have been nice to have the option. The game technically doesn't have any lives, you have your health bar and continues. Why it's called a continue rather than a life I'm not sure, but that's what it's in the manual. You gain more continues by picking up the small tokens you find lying around the level, which will slowly fill the face meter. And once it gets full, you'll get another life, I mean continue, yes continue. This really is a weird and wonderful game, that while it tries to give you hints, it rarely tells you exactly where to go. It's up to you to explore the world to see what you can find, which include levels based around TVs, or music, or one where you're actually playing as a shoot 'em up where you're hanging from a hand glider. There is even one that's a spoof of the Super Mario Brothers called the Super Cutesy Brothers, in which everything has a face. And if you shoot some of those faces, oh, ooh, that's terrifying. That might haunt my dreams. And with that image seared into your brain, it's time to give the unfortunate news that this game is a lot harder to get your hands on than it really should be. Even though one of Gremlin's co-founders actually bought the entire back catalogue to their games way back in 2011, at which point they started an ill-fated attempt at re-releasing them on iOS of all platforms. It's like, what were they thinking? GOG, Steam, hell even a micro console would have made far more sense and probably made far more money than mobile. It, it just boggles the mind. The one thing that has come out of all those licensing deals is the fact that they found the source code to a long lost Mega Drive version, which had been rebranded PJ Gumball Hero, which they actually managed to give the rights to a small indie company called Pinko Interactive to finish it up and try and publish it on the Mega Drive though we've not heard much about it in about two or three years now. But it seems that also wasn't the only version they were doing for the Mega Drive as at one point they actually got the license to the UK ska band Madness and started the process of rebranding the entire game yet again. For some reason or another this deal fell through and while I think Madness are absolutely amazing they are not exactly the target audience for a game like this. As usual, links to all those videos can be found in the description. And until next time, I've been the Goldfish, that was a game with a lot of heart, and this was Goldfish on Games. Goodbye.